morning, true? I don't know that I'm supposed to happen until late October. So, well, hey, thanks for being here at the 930 service. We are glad that you are here uh, because we hate speaking and singing to an empty room. So thanks for being here. Our securities, our insecurities, rather, have been uh, taken care of. And so thanks so much for being here this morning. Just a couple reminders with this new schedule. At this hour, at 9.30, there's full-on kids uh, programming, except for the 5 to 10 age category. And so 5 to 10-year-olds will uh, see lots of you in here, which is fun. Uh, you guys can attend at 9.30, and then you can you can go to Epic Kids for 11 o'clock. And so I see quite a few 5 to 10-year-olds in the room. So just know that if you want to tell your friends about that. Seriously, and, and as adults, you can uh, you don't need to leave the premises. All right, so don't come to 9.30 with your 5 to 10-year-olds. Send them to class and go get a coffee, all right? We need you on the premises. Not great cell reception in here. If emergency arise, arises, we will not be able to get in touch with you. And so uh, so just, just make sure you know that that's what's going on. And uh, like we said, this morning starts it's not an exclusive thing. This morning begins an entirely new schedule for us here at Epic Church. We've had crowd issues, which is a great problem to have. And it's exciting to see. So I've got to ask why you're here at 930, all right? So I just want you to get your hands ready because you're here at 934 a reason or two or three reasons so if you are here because you're awake anyway this early because you have kids or you're just an early morning riser raise your hand high just trying to figure out why you're here all right uh, if you are here because you're an avid nfl football fan raise your hand high. awesome i can't think of any other reason to be here if you're here because you have sacrificed to make room for the 11 o'clock lazy people. Raise your hand. Come on. And I asked someone this morning, what, what are you doing here at 930? They're like, you guilted us into this. And so, yes, whatever it takes. I told you we would uh, do whatever the endless and moves we needed to get uh, people here at 930. Seriously, no, it's great to see the room full. It's great to, to see you guys with us this morning. And we're, we're in our second week of the series we called The Chase. And, 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 and this morning, we're talking about relationships. And it is easier... It is easier to chase relationships in our day and age today than it has ever been in the history of mankind, right? I mean, 2,000 years ago, you couldn't connect with someone in China and ask them out, right? Right right now, you can do that. You can just put a message. I don't know if you get all the messenger requests like I do, but you get a messenger request, you can get a picture. You, I mean, we can chase, you can chase old relationships thanks to Facebook, right? Don't, don't, I mean, we're not going to ask you to be guilty, but some of you have been checking up on your exes. Anybody? Look at one guy that's honest back there. That's awesome. And uh, looks at his wife like, hey, I'm just revealing this to you now too. But uh, anyway, you know, just wanted to make sure you're still prettier than they are. And uh, but but literally today, you can chase relationships easier than you've ever been able to do it in history. You can chase future relationships just like the past. There's some, I'm sure there's some great and some not so great some suspect sites out there, but. You can do the other personals. You can put. Uh, you can go to eHarmony. You can go with. Uh, let's. Uh, it's just lunch. Whatever that is. Hey, ladies, it's never just lunch. All right. Uh, just so you know, it's never just lunch. I mean, it needs to be, but but I'm not sure you can trust those sites. But but there are ways for us to pursue people in relationship. There are ways for us to do that today that we've never been able to do that. Isn't that true? But here's what's amazing. So there are more ways to pursue relationships than there have ever been before, and yet relational happiness isn't at an all-time high, is it? More ways to pursue relationships. You now have access to the entire world in some ways. And yet we're not happier. And it's not working for us all in the end, is it? The series of Chase is really about how we take things that God's given us as gifts in our lives, and, but what we do with those things, we make them ultimate, and we look for our complete and ultimate satisfaction in those things. And for every one of us in this room, the same be true at 11 o'clock, for every one of us in this room, we either have, we are currently doing it, or we will do this when it comes to relationships. Whether it's a, a person in our minds, or it's a person that we're actually in a relationship with, or it's a person that doesn't even know we exist, but we think that if we got a relationship with them, everything would be perfect. Every single one of us have done this. Every one of us will be tempted to continue to do this into the future. Our text for this morning is John chapter 4. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, raise your hand. Our guys and ladies are passing those out right now. Wait, keep your hand up. You can keep this Bible that we're handing to you. Uh, if you're going to give it back, you can write a note to the next person. Like, hey, I guess you forgot yours too, or whatever. But this is a small gift from Epic to you just to say, hey, we want you to have a copy of God's Word. 
It is small print, so if your eyes aren't incredible or if they are just not as good as they used to be, email us. We will be more than happy to order some larger print Bibles for, for you. I don't know if we've got money to budget for a picture Bible, if that's more your thing, but we'll figure out some way to, uh, to, to meet your needs. So John chapter 4, in the New Testament, it is uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. John comes between Luke and Acts. And in John chapter 4, it's a story we got into a little bit two weeks ago, and I want to come back to the story this morning. And just to set a little bit of context, Jesus has been doing ministry uh, for a little while now, and he's exhausted. It's incredible to see the humanity of Jesus. He gets exhausted just like you and I get exhausted. And uh, so Jesus is exhausted. He sits down in this town called Sychar. It's in a town in Samaria. He sits down by a well that's known as Jacob's Well. And he has this incredible conversation with the Samaritan woman. And so we've got Sam, uh, just to follow along here, to honor God's word. Verses 7 through 18. It says that a woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will be in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. You may have seen it. Pray that God will bless the, the, the reading and the teaching of His Word that we believe is found in the Scriptures. An incredible encounter that Jesus has with this Samaritan woman. And it begins right off the bat there in verse 7. Jesus is literally just expressing a physical need that He has. He's thirsty. He is exhausted. He's exhausted. He's worn out. So He says to her, would you give me a drink? And it's interesting, she doesn't even yet know that he's the Messiah. That's coming down the road. She doesn't even know that he's the Messiah, and yet she already understands that he has no business speaking to her because she's a woman from Samaria. You see in the parentheses perhaps there in your Bible that it says that the Jews did not associate with the Samaritans. The, the reason that we know the Good Samaritan story, the reason it sticks out, the reason later on in the Bible that Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan because it was very unlikely that the Samaritan would have anything to do with the situation going on, especially related to the priest having the opportunity. And so, Jesus said, right off the bat, she is letting us in on something. She is limited in who she has access to. Right off the bat, you see this about this woman, and we'll understand why later, and why she's even more limited. She's limited as to who she has access to. Jesus says, can I, he asks a simple question, right? He says, I need a, I need a drink of water. And, and she doesn't give him the drink of water. She says, how can you, how can you be speaking to me? So right off the bat, you see the woman surprised that this Jewish man, she has no idea yet that he's a prophet. Better yet, she has no idea that he's the Messiah, the long-awaited Jesus that she's been living for. And yet, right from the beginning, she says, how can you... How can you speak to me? How, how can you do this? She says, how, how can you ask me, a woman of Samaria? Jews did not deal with Samaritans. And, and then Jesus is a master. I mean, I guess he's God. He should be good at conversation, right? He, he's a master when it comes to conversations. He, he starts off by expressing his own physical need. And then he shifts and he turns the conversation really, really quickly. And he says in verse 10 to her, Woman, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, 
you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If you are a person who underlines or take notes, I think this is a phrase worth underlining or writing down. If you knew the gift of God. If you knew the gift of God. Jesus says something incredible to this woman. He says, listen, if you knew who I was, if you knew the gift of God, you would have been the one asking me for a drink. He shifts this thing really, really quickly. And you guys ever have people that you're talking to, you're talking to them about one thing and they respond with something out of left field? Married to anyone like that? They're like, no, I just wanted to know if I could watch football. And she's giving you like, or I will say she, he or she, is giving you the lowdown on, on what you really need to be thinking about and what your issues are. Right? Well, with Jesus, he, he does it, but the conversation, it, it seems to really take a, a, you know, like you're driving down the road and you're just going slow and all of a sudden the accelerator comes on. Jesus does that with the conversation. So she's hearing, can I have a drink of water? She's saying, how can you be talking to me? And Jesus says this incredible phrase to her and to us this morning. If you knew the gift of God. If you knew what was being offered to you, you would have asked me and I would have given it to you. This morning, I want to help you and I in our relationships. I really do. But this is not going to be, hey, here's top ten ways to get a girl guy. Or, uh, I, mean, I can give you that. that, that that's not free. Later. Uh, check my email. Uh, it, it's not going to be a way, hey, five ways to improve your marriage or your friendships or your relationship with your kids. That's not what we're doing this morning. But I want your relationships to improve. I want them to get better. But more than that, I want you to get this phrase. I want you and I to know the gift of God. I want us to understand what Jesus is offering here. I want us to understand what he's asking us about. I want us to get the fact that he is making something available to us. Because if we knew the gift of God, we might not search for last and fulfillment everywhere else. If we knew the gift of God, we might run to God first and not as a last resort. If you and I really knew the gift that God is offering us this morning, we might invest in a relationship with Him. But if you're like me, you're really good about finding everyone else to invest in. If you're like me, you're, you're about looking for someone that's actually going to, to, to make the, the supreme difference, going to bring you the ultimate joy. And Jesus says, sir, if you knew the gift of God, Ladies, there is someone who wants to offer you what you're longing for. Men, there is someone who wants to offer you relationally what you are longing for and what I'm longing for this morning. There's someone that wants to do that. Here's what I want to be clear on this morning. Your desires are not playing tricks on you. Okay? Your desires have not deceived you. And here's what I mean by that. You feel this longing, you feel this emptiness, and you think, man, that's so, that's so cruel. Like I have this craving or these cravings within me and I can't find anything that does it for me. That's a cruel trick from God. It isn't a cruel trick from God. The reasons you have desires, your desires are not seen. The reasons you have the longings that you do is because God has made you for more than what you and I experience in those things. He's made us for more. He's not playing hide and seek with our desires. He's not, he's not implanting <laughs> desires within our souls and then going, ah, oh, you never can get it. He's given us the desires that He's given us for a reason, that He wants, he wants to fill those things. And, and, and what some of us have done is that we, we have longed or wished for our, our, our thirst to go away. Right? And Jesus being talking to this woman about the things that she's thirsty for. And some of us with our desires, we just wanted them to go away. Haven't we? We've tried things to fill those desires. We've tried relationships. We've pursued people. We've pursued experiences. We've pursued, th- pursued things with our jobs. We've pursued things all over our lives. And then we don't get those things filled and we step back and we go, you know what, it would be better if I never had to fill that emptiness. It would be better if I never had to uh, understand that those desires were present and they were active within me. But that's, that's not what's happened. Look at verse 14. She, Jesus says to her, uh, the, the water here in verse 13, people will be thirsty again. But in 14 he says, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Jesus is wanting and offering to take this woman's thirst away, but he's not offering to do that by simply dismissing her thirst out of her soul. What is he doing? He's not, he's, not, he's not removing the thirst, is he? He's not dismissing it. 
The way that he actually gets rid of the thirst is by offering something that will fill So your answer this morning is not to get rid of your desires. The answer this morning is not to pray that the emptiness will go away. The answer this morning is not to say, I'm done with men or I'm done with women. It didn't work for me, so let's just dismiss those relational desires that I have. That isn't the answer. The answer is to find something that will fill it, find it. Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but the, the water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now there's a huge shift that happens between verse 15 and 16. Humor is to me. See if you find it funny. Just think about the person that jumps. Any, any of you ever jump when you're in conversation? Like you jump from one subject to another without telling the person that you went to another thing? Yeah, you've got one man doing that. Two men. Three men, no women in any of oh, There we go, there we go. So I've been in conversations with people in my life, and I'm just like, how did you get here today? Right? Like, how did you get here today? Well, Jesus is about to do this between 15 and 16. The woman listens to his offer, and she says, I want that. And listen to his response. The woman said to him, verse 15, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Now, let's not look ahead. What would have been a logical response from Jesus at that moment? Three words I've got. Here you go. Right? Doesn't that make sense? Isn't that the request? And it's not like she's initiating the conversation. Jesus initiated the conversation about this living water. She said, I'm in. So why doesn't Jesus just go, here you go? Listen to the shift. He says, I want the water. He says, go call your husband. How does that fit? It's like, I want that. You've offered me that. And he says, go get your husband. What does he do it? What does this segment he wants to bring up about husbands have to do with the conversation that previously took place? He's physically thirsty, then he starts talking about how she is spiritually thirsty, and he has this water to offer. How do they go from talking? What does it have to do with the husband conversation? What does it have to do with the previous conversation about thirst? It has everything to do with it. It has absolutely everything to do with it. It makes this crazy shift. Go call your husband and come here. Go call your husband and come here. And then it says, I don't have, she says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, that's correct. You feel like Jesus is baiting her a little bit here? Right? He's like, you can go call her husband. She says, I don't have a husband. And he says, you're right. You're right. So they, they, they're talking forever about thirst, thirst, thirst. But he brings up thirst and water as much as he possibly can. Sorry about that, guys. I, I will my bad. He brings up thirst as much as he possibly can, and then they have a whole conversation about her husbands. And, and so now Jesus has established the truth that she doesn't have a husband currently, but she's had five of them before. Why does he bring this up? What, what is he getting at? Here's what he's getting. Human beings and not other human beings like us human beings. We oftentimes have gotten into relationships because of our thirst. Right? Because we long for something that will finally do it. Because we, we, we believe that, that this man or this woman will finally be the, the one who satisfies what I've been longing for all of my life. I mean, ladies, at what grade did you start thinking about your wedding? Seriously, we're great. But you weren't even in school. Right? Guys, when did you start thinking? The day of hormones. I got it. I got it. The day of. Come on. So, Jesus is revealing not just her thirst, he's revealing our thirst. Not only do people get into relationships because they're thirsty, it's also a great reason we get out of relationships, isn't it? Because we're still thirsty. 
Because we put a weight on that man. Or we put a weight on that woman. It's a God-sized weight. And we literally, we would never say this. We don't think they really look like God. But we were hanging our hopes on them in a way that only a person can hang their hopes on God. So we get into relationships because of that. We get out of it. And what Jesus is doing with this woman and doing with us is he's exposing how she has solved and quenched her thirst. Now, the text doesn't say this. And let's just presume a little bit this morning. Why did she get in and out of all those relationships? I don't have an answer, so just give it to me. She's lonely. It makes sense that she would get into a relationship because she's lonely, but she couldn't get out of it because she's lonely. Insecure. It wasn't what she thought. Here's what I know for sure, I think, without seeing it in the scriptures. One of two things is true. Either she didn't get what she thought she was getting, or all of those men did not get what they thought they were getting. And a good chance, man, it was both. <laughs> Could there have been abuse? Maybe. Probably, probably not in all five. But there, there, there are a lot of hypothetical things we can throw out here. But let's stick to what, what I know had to be true. Either she didn't get what she thought she was getting. And remember for this woman, she literally, she didn't even think Jesus could speak to her. So she came into life because of her background, knowing that her choices had to be limited when it came to relationships. So she's willing to settle. They're willing to settle, perhaps. And, and Jesus is trying to get at what, her, what, what she's been thirsting after. Here's what's amazing to me. Not that Jesus simply loves her, and not that Jesus knows everything about her. What's amazing to me is that knowing everything about her, he offers her something in your well. Knowing everything about this woman, he offers her something. I mean, think about it, guys and ladies. What man would have wanted this woman? In our culture today, the term leftovers comes to mind. What man would have wanted her? She's already a Samaritan. She already, Jesus, now he could have been using his, his divinity here to know that she had five husbands, but it could have just literally been her reputation. There's at least five guys that know her reputation, right? And back in the day, remember, the people never got far off away from their families. So there's at least five, well now a sixth person, and they all have friends, and they all have families that live in the village. Jesus knows this woman's reputation. He knows how she has sought to quench that thirst. And yet he still offers her something incredible. Namely, himself. And this morning, this may haunt you. It haunts me a little bit, but I want to get it out. Jesus knows every way that you try to quench your thirst. He knows everything that you chase. He knows everything that you put your stock in. He knows everything that you look to to give you that transcendence or that final and ultimate joy or something that would finally last. He knows what you've done, and yet He doesn't come to us to condemn us. He comes to us and makes us a better offer. And just so we're clear, this is not about knocking relationships, and it's not about knocking the, the, your significant other or my significant other. I can't do that. I need to eat today. But He comes with a better offer. And not only does he offer himself, he promises that we can find fulfillment. He promises that we'll find satisfaction in him. He promises that he'll give us something that will not make us thirsty anymore. He gives us something better. Are you looking to another human being to be your God or Savior? Like, I know you would never say that to me, right? I know you're not really going out. I'm, I'm, I'm pursuing or I want to be with or I'm married to God, right? I know none of you are saying that. But some of us get into relationships and not knowing it, literally believe that we can finally stake our hopes and joys and ultimate fulfillment on another man or on another woman. Are you looking to someone to be your God? Are you looking to someone to be a Savior for you? Is someone looking to you for that? Listen, you might be the best boyfriend in the world. Anybody want to run for that song? The guy that's married said he's in. Let's tell you it's not You may be the best girlfriend. You may be the best friend and the best mom or dad. You may be the best husband or wife. You really may be. But you made a horrible guy. that 
complain on another person, think how unfair that is. The question is, how, how do we know if we put that on someone else? Well, if by your actions and the way that you speak to them on a consistent basis, it shows that you're looking to them to be perfect, or every time you're unhappy, it's not anybody else's fault but theirs, you might be looking to that man or woman to be your God. Listen to what Tim Keller says in his book, Counterfeit Gods. And by the way, we're going through these in our epic groups. 160 adults are part of these, and we'd love for you guys to join if you're not in. But here's what he says in this book. He's talking about the story of Jacob and, and, and Leah and Rachel. And, and here's what he said. He said, if you get married as Jacob did, putting the weight of all your deepest hopes and longings on the person you were marrying, you are going to crush him or her with your expectations. It will distort your life and your spouse's life in a hundred ways. No person, not even the best one, can give your soul all it needs. No person, not even the best one, can give your soul all it needs. Here's something else I want to say this morning. No human relationship can bear the weight of divine expectation. No human relationship. Not the romantic one, not the friend one, not the uh, parent-child one. I've, I've seen plenty of moms literally look to find their joy in their children. Right? People do this. Adoption is a great thing, but sometimes people go and adopt a child because their kids are grown, they can't control them anymore, they can't look to them, them for joy, they can't live by care, they threw them at their little baseball games and the little dance recitals so they get another one. We do this in relationships all the time. No human relationship can bear the weight of divine expectation. And let me say this, the lower that you were made, men and women, just because that person you're in a relationship with or will be is discovering this morning that you're not God, doesn't mean you get to be a jerk. Right? With me? Like you can't be like, you're like, I cannot believe you talk to me like that. can't believe you don't help our family. And you're like, well, I'm not God. That, that doesn't work. All right? That excuse is outlawed as of this morning. God still has expectations for us. He knows we're not, like, just so everybody understands this too. Like, you're like, what's God think about this message? God's not up there going, I'm not talking with me. I, I, I literally thought she was me. My goodness. He's not doing that. He's offering us something better. I, I want to invite just a, a guest up this morning to uh, help answer a couple of questions, maybe in a practical way. So I'm going to ask my wife, Shauna, to come to the stage. Give it up for Shauna. Come on.
you know, I know that you're not God, and certainly I know that I'm God. Uh, sometimes I think because our marriage has, has been in its strongest place, I think that maybe we're going to arrive at, sometimes I trick myself maybe, and think we're going to arrive at a place where, all right, now, now I can be everything she needs. And, and, and no matter, like you said, no matter how much we improve or get better at this thing, that's what's going to happen. Well, knowing that, uh, how do we, you and I, make the most of our relationship? How do these, whether it's friendships, uh, father-son, daughter, uh, son or daughter, uh, mother relationship, uh, friendships, how do we uh, make the most of relationships? Because even though they can't be God, they, they're huge. We're, we're relational creatures. So how do we make the most of our relationships? Well, when we believe that Jesus is the only one who truly satisfies men our joy, rest in Him, then we get to make the most of our relationships. When there's God, and then everything else follows after that. Um, because when we do that, then our relationships are not that God, or our relationships are not filling that void. Um, but instead, those relationships are received as a blessing. Those relationships are received as a gift from God. Not to be elevated above Him, but to be enjoyed by Thanks so much. We got to give her a hand. Stop trying to redeem ourselves through our pursuits and relationships 
because we are already redeemed. We stop trying to make others into saviors because we have a savior. Imagine what happens in our relationships when we understand that we have a Savior in Christ and we don't have to look for a Savior in another man or another woman. Imagine when you and I find our identity and who God has made us to be. And I don't have to find it in you. And you don't have to find it in her. And she doesn't have to find it in, in, in him. And we're set free. And again, no excuse here for being a jerk, okay? Do not use that this week. I mean, I'm going to do it in jest with my wife. I'm just going to be joking. When she asks me to do this way tomorrow, I'll be like, oh my God, come on. Be straight with some of maybe everyone else in the room. Some, some of you are in relationships that you don't need to be in. You are. Some of you are in relationships that you do need to be in, that God has given into your life, but you need to be honest with yourself and with that other person. Maybe as early as lunch today, and say, Hey, I never have called you God, and I don't plan on calling you God, but I've looked to you to bring me the ultimate happiness and joy, and I can no longer do that. The conversation needs to happen for some of them. And others of you that aren't in a relationship right now, you've got two outlooks, I believe. Probably one or two outlooks. Either you still believe there is a person that exists that will do it for you, or because you've tried that route, you never want to get into another one again. And Christ offers us hope this morning. And we don't, we, we don't get the living water from Him so that we get the, the, the physical water from somewhere else. We, we come to Him because we realize He alone can satisfy. He alone will fulfill. He is able to fill the weight that He's placed within us. The God who has given us the deep desires and longings of our souls is the God who fills the deep desires and longings of our souls. And one other note, because I know this is true of some of you. Some of you have, have, have had others that you've been in a relationship with leave this earth. So you're like, what, what do I do? I had an incredible man in my life, or I had an incredible wife, or a friend in my life. What do I do? I think the offer to you is the same as it is to all of us. Realize that Jesus comforts broken hearts. Realize that we see in the scriptures that when others were sad, he was sad with them. But at the same time, he still offers you satisfaction that you'll never find in another man or another woman. Would you guys pray with me this morning? I'm going to pray, and then Brad's going to just lead us in just a time of reflection. I don't know if the relational thing in regards to a romantic relationship is what you need to think through this morning. I don't know if it's a situation with a parent or a child, uh, if it's a situation just with a really good friend. But would you just be honest with yourself and God this morning and, and, and ask this question? Who are you looking to give you what only God can do? And what would it do if you were freed from that weight? What would it do for you if you no longer had to look to him or to her to get what you know your soul longs for? And you're holding other people up to a standard that they'll never meet. God's a relational God. He's made us relational creatures. That alone has brought us great joy at times and great sorrow at other times. Jesus said that he came to give us something that would quench our thirst. Why don't we take them up on this one? God, would you come and do for us what we can do for ourselves? Do we understand the way in which you satisfy the longings in our soul? And God, understanding this about you won't take us out of relationships, but it will make us better in the relationship, God. It will remove a weight that the other person can't bear anyway. God, thank you for knowing our past and still offering yourself. God, we thank you that our past doesn't have to dictate our future. God, come and make us new in the area of our relationships this morning as we find fulfillment and lasting joy.